All right. So this time, I really am just going to do a really quick lecture. I'm not going to be doing a whole bunch of picture stuff. I'm going to leave that to you. So we've gone over in the first video um, myosin, actin, tropomyosin, troponin, calcium, troponin in the heart, titan, eh, nebulin, and alpha actin. So now moving on. Um, underneath structure, <clears throat> we can remember that there is a protein called dystrophin. All right, dystrophin attaches to the fibers inside the muscle, not the muscle fibers, but like collagen, reticular collagen fibers inside the cell, and that to the, um, the membrane of the cell, the phospholipid bilayer, and so that's a dystrophin, and it, and it links those two together so that when the muscle contracts, the outside of the cell moves with it instead of it just being the sarcomeres contracting and they're not attached to anything and so they just sort of do an accordion thing. That's how I understand it. I had another professor say that. Um, professor Schmidt said that they still don't fully understand why it does, but I understood that it was like there's an accordion going inside of the cell itself and the membrane on the outside of the cell didn't move because there was nothing attaching the membrane to the actual sarcomere and myofibril structure. And so they would get shorter, but then the membrane didn't get shorter. And so it's kind of like an accordion that's playing inside the cell, and it doesn't do anything. So that was one thing, dystrophin. Another thing um, was the structure inside a cell. And so we have, um, <clears throat> moving away from dystrophin, going a little bit deep to that, we have um, T-tubules, which are both superficial to dystrophin and deep, I guess. So T-tubules, this is the surface, all right? And action potentials go along the surface because of sodium, voltage-gated sodium channels that have been triggered by synapse, which we'll just write up here. And acetylcholine goes out here, it hits receptors. The receptors make a depolarization that's big enough that this sodium channel, voltage-gated sodium channel opens, sodium goes in, action potential goes on, it goes into the T-tubules, and then you have a bunch of other stuff. Um, hopefully that all makes sense. He went over a lot of that in previous lectures, so in this one we're just going to skip to T-tubules go inside the cell and they go throughout in kind of a net-like fashion and so they touch every myofibril, which is a muscle, a very small muscle fiber, and there's t like a dozens of them inside of a single muscle cell. Okay, so I'm going to draw a representation really quick right here. This is a myofibril. Um, it's passing behind the T-tubule, and then maybe there's a T-tubule in front of it down here, and the Z-disc is close to the T-tubule, at least in the representation he showed us, so these are Z-discs. All right, T-tubule, and then also surrounding all of this place, <clears throat> kind of surrounding the entire... Um, Yeah, see, I told you, I can't take notes and talk at the same time. All right, so <clears throat> surrounding a lot of the area is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, longitudinal sarcoplasmic reticulum, it's where all the calcium is stored. So it needs to be everywhere, really close to all the myofibrils. Capiche? So T-tubule, longitudinal um, sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then there's also a whole bunch of mitochondria which is covering, um, it, which is also probably in between, it, it's really close to all the myofibrils. Um, and that's where a lot of the energy comes from, and you need the mitochondria, for example, for myoglobin, which holds oxygen, to really be effective, because oxygen is used in the mitochondria. Okay? Um, and then another thing to remember is this is called a myofibril, which I've kind of been using that term the entire time, but actually that's something that we learned right here. That's a myofibril, and it is the first unit of like contraction force. Sarcomeres are inside of myofibrils. A ton of myofibrils are in a single muscle cell. So that was uh, the second point of structure, and um, those four things are required for 
um, the cell to do its work. Hopefully e the reason for each of those makes sense to you. <clears throat> T tubules to get the action potentials to go everywhere evenly so that they're all contracting at the same time because what if there's a myofibril really far, if there was no T tubules and a myofibril was in the center far away from the edge where you have the sodium potassium pump, that means that the ones near the edge would be contracting. The one in the center wouldn't be contracting for a while because all the calcium is far away. And this is a point where I would take a second to review what are your categories uh, and what's in them. Um, with all of that picture I just drew, those four points, um, you could have those as four separate points, but they were all kind of the same picture, so you could also have them as one point, and just remember there's four things inside that little point. Moving on. Um, Mr. Finn, structure, third thing was... is the bands. All right, so here's the Z-disc. I'll draw it in black. I know it helps some people if you're consistent with color. See? He does care. All right. There's a Z-disc. There's another Z-disc. Then you have the myosin line in the center here. Weep, 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 weep. Yeah, I make funny sounds when I do this because I have all my filters turned off. All right, there's myosin. And then we're going to have actin, which I think was just black cell. There's actin. There's actin. Nebulin and um, tropomyosin are in there. We'll go ahead and draw the tropomyosin because it's important for this. And then we have troponin and calcium. All right. Oh, we're not showing the motor action, but calcium would bind to troponin in the little circle here. And then the head would be able to get in there and bind. So, but right now we're just talking about lines. So I remembered all these lines because the M line or the A area are kind of the same-ish thing. The M line is representing all the myosin. It also has an A area where they were just looking at the colors in the band and it happens to be that where actin and myosin are all overlapping, they called that the A band. I remember that as all the things are right there. The actin, the myosin, it's all there. All right. And then the Z disc over here. Hopefully that one I've said enough that it's like, yeah, we know a Z disc. And then the I, which I think of as isolated. Now, all of these things, isolated is really helpful. I actually just did this. Maisie is a crazy person. Okay? She's kind of loopy. M A Z I in a spiral. There you go. You have all of the disc areas that he has gone over. Mazy, loopy spiral. Okay? So, <clears throat> that was banding structure. I can, there is some, you might want to review some detail on just what those look like, but the white one is the eye, and then the Z discs are where there's just like that line that you can actually see, that's just a thin line, and then the M and the A are where it gets like that dark, broad band in the middle because there's a lot of stuff there, you know? All right, next. I thought it was really cool when he talked about um, rigor mortis when you're dead. And yeah, don't do that, by the way. Bad for your health. Healthy doctors here. All right, when he talked about rigor mortis, <clears throat> I personally wanted to remember details about that. We didn't have to, but I thought of a, a clock, because rigor mortis sets in 13 hours after death, at about, and then it can last until 48 to, 68, uh, to 60 hours, and then it lets go. Why? Um, we'll get into why in just a sec. Um, rigor mortis, um, I remembered that by, you can remember it how you want. I made a clock with 13 hours, and then I made two of them to represent two days. 48 hours, and then I had the 60 seconds being the 60, so next. All right, rigor mortis um, helps us remember when ATP is used. That's why it's like, oh dang, if I understand rigor mortis and remember it, I know the, the cross bridge cycle, or the which is another name for the myosin grabbing the actins um, and, and pulling them. So there are two major things that you want to remember. Why did I erase all of those myosins? Because I need a bigger one and I'm smart. All right. All right, there's some myosin heads. They have a little space for ATP. I hope you can see that good. OK. Now, the actin down here, and the tropomyosin. Tropomyosin, 
and then you've got troponin right here, and the star of the cell, category one, number two, object three or four, bam, calcium. All right, that means that the tropomyosin is available for this guy to come. All right, currently, he, as soon as it opens, this guy is going to bind, and he's going to bind super strong, okay? Um, he's got ADP right now, ADP, because he used it up to get himself ready for this, but we'll get there, we'll get there, okay? So, part of the cycle, first part of the cycle, calcium allows the head to bind. It makes a really strong binding um, situation right there. Schmidt didn't emphasize this, but it really helps with the concept, so I'm adding it. It binds strong right there because literally it's what's making muscle work. If it was a weak bond and you tried to contract while carrying something, what would happen? It would slip, let go, and you would be like, you wouldn't, it wouldn't work. So it's a very strong bond. And that is why it takes, step two, it takes ATP to make this thing let go. And so ATP comes in, ATP comes in, to release this sucker, okay? And it forces the myosin head to let go, and it moves the myosin head into a cocked or ready to do another power stroke um, formation, which is what it should have looked like before the first step, but. All right, forgive the art, all right? And then, once it's cocked with ATP, the ATP turn, um, it used up one of the phosphates in doing that, so the ATP turns into ADP by making it let go. And then it hangs around until it's forced off by another ATP after the next cycle. Okay, so right now it's cocked, it's like ready to go, and calcium comes in, tropomyosin is. Um, moved out of the way enough that it can that the myosin can now bind, which it loves to do and it does super tight. And then it pulls, it pulls the actin. And I'm sure that makes sense. I'm probably making this a little bit too enunciated, but it pulls the actin and causes contraction. Calcium binds, allows this to hit it. ATP comes to force it to let go. Now Hopefully that makes sense. Calcium and ATP, if you understand those two steps, the rest of it's like right there. You don't need to memorize the rest of it. Calcium comes in, lets it bind. Super tight bind requires ATP to make it let go. Question, if you're dead, are you making ATP? No. Good answer. So, when you run out of ATP, what's going to make it let go? Nothing. So it's holding on in a contracted state forever. And that's why you have rigor mortis. 13 hours later, 13 hours later, all the ATP has been used up, so it can't let go anymore. And so all of them are in the contracted state. 60 hours after death, 48 to 60, all of the myosin heads have been torn off or degraded by enzymes, because all the cells with the lysozymes, protein degraders, lysozymes, um, have just been apoptosis exploding all over the place and so the myosin gets chewed up and that's why rigor mortis goes away. So understanding rigor mortis makes this a piece of cake and understanding this makes rigor mortis a piece of cake. And so once you understand it, just review it. All right, so um, you might make that a thing, a line item. All right, next, types. All right, then he went over types of muscle cells, all right? There was red and white. All right, red, he talked about the, the uh, turkey leg. I'm just gonna draw a drumstick here because um, I'm not vegetarian. I like him. So red muscle fibers are the ones that have lots of myoglobin, which is what makes them darker, and that's why they're called red. Um, if you have enough, if you remember the whale meat, it turns black. Myoglobin has oxidized iron, so oxygen is resting on the iron, and that makes a dark, rustish color. And if you have enough of that, it turns black. So um, with all that oxygen there, they can keep going forever. So basically, these are the ones 
that can continue doing things aerobically for a long time. All right? White, um, and there are two types. There was one that was um, sub, sub slow. The subtext was slow. There were letters up here that I don't remember, to be honest. Um, and then there was a subtext um, to alpha. Um, were the two red um, muscle uh, subtypes that he wanted us to remember. So in white, in white muscle, there is both um, a 2x and a 2, um, 2b or beta. I think it was b. It was b. All right. And those use glycolysis to break it down, to break down glucose, and then they use glucose in the fermentation kind of a cycle to get way stronger contraction at the beginning. But they fatigue super fast because you run out of glucose super fast. Oxygen, um, you can get more ATP from, and you last longer with it, but you won't get as strong a contractile force. So. White is strong, but no endurance. Red is weaker, but lots of endurance. Okay? And then he categorized these into fast and slow twitch. It's really cool, because the only slow twitch literally has slow in the name. Everything else is fast twitch. Okay? I just drew a bracket like this, saying those three things are considered fast twitch. That other one isn't. Oh, and I also put metal, lines of metal, so I guess it was a cyborg turkey into the drumstick to remember, oh yeah, lots of iron. All right, moving on. Um, there is also twitch summation, which basically is the last category that I added at the very end um, in my head. It was such a small one that I didn't bother saying it to you at the beginning. But in twitch summation, there are two things. There's um, I, I learned it as temporal summation and spatial summation because I've actually heard these before. He said it as um, fiber, twitch fiber um, summation, and then motor unit summation. So the twitch, fi the fiber twitch summation is just um, that one fiber is getting um, activated by action potentials, and it can get activated by one, by one, and then later another one, or like two right next to each other. Um, the two that are farther apart allow them to kind of synergize and get the best contractile force, which is called a late um, summation. And so that's the one you want to remember. The two that are close together are only used when you're trying to do like tetanus and keep it always super contracted, no relaxation. We don't care if it's efficient. And so you just keep on hitting it with action potentials, and it stays right up at the top of its contractile force. So this is kind of like a graph. Whereas if you didn't care if it stayed at the top, you'd probably use the two separate ones, which would then make it go something like this rather than that. See what I'm saying? The dotted line is when they have a synergistic summative effect. They help each other because they're not right on top of each other versus they only kind of get in each other's way, but they keep it right at the but, um, but if you want to keep it at the top with no relaxation ever, then you do the tetanus thing where it's like da 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 action potential, action potential, action potential, action potential. Motor neuron summation is the same thing. Motor unit summation is the same thing. Um, if they come right on top of each other, they're less efficient. If there's only one, it's weaker. And if there's two that are spaced, then they're more efficient. It's just with more motor units, um, more myofibrils. So I hope that that helps. Um, there is one other detail that I'm going to throw at you, and let's see if you can insert it into your knowledge, even though it's out of order, because sometimes this happens. I'm sure you can think of some lectures where it's happened. So um, going back to types, there is calcium being taken out of the cell by a calcium, calcium pump. And that is one of the major differences in these cells, is how fast is calcium taken out of the cytosol. 
and therefore no longer available to troponin to pull tropomyosin into a formation where my the myosin heads can bind. So you need to take calcium out so it doesn't keep contracting. All right. So the ones that are really good at taking calcium out are the fast twitch. The ones that are really not as good at taking calcium out are the slow twitch. Because it doesn't matter if you can do stuff super fast with the slow twitch. It's for stuff like you're, you want to do it forever, not necessarily fast. And so these are vacuums, vacuum hoses. And I just had a huge vacuum hose at the bottom with the number 220. Uh, with the number 20 down here, 20 milliseconds. And then this one has 200 milliseconds as the time that it takes to do it. Um, I hope this has all helped. That is probably 90% of the material that he went over in lecture. Um, there were a couple tiny, tiny things that I am sure I missed. I don't know what they are. Um, I can just leave that. So hopefully all of this helped. And I will see you. If this helped, please tell me. And if it did, then if, if this did help, then I'll make another video next week. And if it didn't, then I'll save my time. So thank you and uh, good night.